to the very first Gutorm Jessing lecture at the Museum of Cultural History. This lecture will be an annual event where the museum invites prominent scholars to debate issues of high relevance to the museum's core areas of research. The lecture celebrates the scholarship of Gutorm Jessing, renowned archaeologist and anthropologist and head of the ethnographic collections for a quarter of a century. But Jessing is not just a historical figure for archaeologists and anthropologists. His scholarship resonates with core areas of research and engagement critical to the museum of cultural history's interpretation of its role in academia and society in the 21st century. The first distinguished scholar to give a Jessing lecture is Thomas Hylland Eriksen. Thomas Hylland Eriksen is a long-time professor at the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Oslo. He is an international rec recognized anthropologist and a political engaged scholar, very much in the spirit of Jessing. His lecture today is titled Cooling Down the Overheated Anthropocene, Lessons from Anthropology and Cultural History. So, Thomas, the stage is yours. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Horkon. Of course, it's, uh, it goes without saying that it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here and, uh, and to have been given this invitation to talk about uh, some of the, you might say, burning issues of today from the perspective of our disciplines. Uh, one thing that you may not be aware of is the fact that today is also the World Environment Day. It's not it's very strongly marked here, but I just read some of that. The, the Green Party wants it to be a national holiday, and I feel confident that Yesing would probably have immediately supported that idea, because he was prone to supporting such ideas. So, uh, so, uh, let, so let me start. I have a manuscript that I'm going to read out for once, in order not to lose myself in digressions, which I still may do. But that least the risk is seriously reduced since I have a manuscript. So. The Anthropocene. Never before has humanity placed its stamp on the planet in ways even remotely comparable to the situation in the late modern period. Human domination of the Earth is such that the term Anthropocene has become widespread as a label for the present time. A nomenclature which, if widely adopted, would make the Holocene, which began just 11,500 years ago, a brief interlude in the long history of the planet. So we live in an era which, since the onset of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, is marked by human activity and expansion in unprecedented ways. And things are changing faster and faster. With no direction, it may sometimes seem. The situation, I shall argue, represents a major challenge for all of us, whether we identify with kin groups, nations, religions or humanity, no matter how we define the word we. Uh, uh, whether we are academics, carpenters or peasants. Taking my cue from Guterin Messing's bid for social engagement among anthropologists, I'm going to use this opportunity to explore some of the ways in which anthropology can contribute knowledge, enabling us not only to come to terms with, but perhaps also to transcend the contradictions and mounting problems generating through humanity's currently frantic transformations of the planet. But first, it seems appropriate to provide a little bit more context about the man whose name this lecture series carries. If anything, as, as Håkon pointed out, if anything, Guter Messing, who died in 1979, was an engaged scholar, determined
an anthropological theorist of the 20th century. And although he had ceased publishing years ago, his mind had not given in. But his time was nearly over, and he was aware of it. The book many consider its most important, the one on kinship, had been published nearly 60 years earlier. Okay? So, he had a long life. And on his birthday, Lévi-Sauce received a visit from President Nicolas Sarkozy. I mean, because France is, I mean, believe it or not, it's a country where, it can, among politicians, you can increase your symbolic capital by associating with intellectuals. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the president visited him, and, um, and uh, Levi Strauss didn't say much. I mean, after all, he was 100 years old, okay? But he said a few things. He, he said that he scarcely considered himself among the living anymore, and by saying so, he did not merely refer to his reduced capacities and advanced age, but also the fact that the world to which he had devoted his life was all but gone. The world of the small stateless peoples, right, on, on which his, uh, his theorizing had been based. Uh, they have now been incorporated into states, markets, and monetary systems of production and exchange. But he also said another thing during his brief meeting with the president. He said, Maintenant, le monde est trop plein. Now the world is too full. By this, he clearly referred to the fact that the world was filled with people, their projects, and the material products of their activities. The world was, as I would say, overheated. There were by now seven billion of us, compared to two billion at the time of his birth. And quite a few of them seem to be busy shopping, posting updates on Instagram, migrating, working in mines and factories, learning the ropes of political mobilization and identity politics, and acquiring the rudiments of English. So overheating is about globalization. It is, to be precise, about the kind of runaway globalization that we have experienced full on since the early 1990s. Change, growth, development have been with us as, as the cultural templates and as uh, um, cognitive engines for uh, moving on since the 19th century, as positive ideals and as societal projects. But there is something new and frightening about the contemporary speed, scope and scale of change today. As I said, there's no thermostat, no governor, as they would say in the old cybernetic uh, jargon, uh, no instance which can say that enough is enough. Um, as a date for the transition from modernity to postmodernity, I propose 1991. Some of you may have heard me say this before, so bear with me, but it, it needs repeating for the sake of the context. Um, first, 1991 was a year in which a Cold War ended in its original form. I mean, until 1991, since, uh, since the Second World War, uh, the ideological conflict between capitalism and socialism had somehow defined the world even through proxy wars in the global south and, and so on. It was a lens through which one could understand a bit of what was going on, quite a bit. And it, were, and it had been replaced by the triumphant sound of one hand clapping. In the same year, the Indian economy uh, was massively deregulated by Rajiv Gandhi's government. Um, by 1991, it was also clear that apartheid was about to be relegated to the dustbin of history. Nelson Mandela had been released from jail towards the end of 1990, and uh, negotiations between the National pa Nationalist Party and the ANC were now on uh, in a serious way. Um, and I haven't even mentioned China. This was also around the time when Deng Xiaoping gave his famous speech where he said something along the lines of, the, the color of the cat doesn't matter as long as it catches mice. In other words, let's be pragmatic and move on from, uh, from stale uh, state-centered communism and, uh, and find new paths of development. So the future of the entire world now seemed to consist in a version of global neoliberalism. That is to say, a, a virulent and, and rather active form of deregulating capitalism were the main road of the state, which is much more considerable than many are aware, uh, consisted in ensuring the functioning of so-called free markets. However, it soon became clear that neoliberalism did not deliver the goods. Social inequalities continued to exist, and in some countries like the United States, they grew quite significantly. Countries in the global south did not develop along the predicted lines, and commentators as diverse as the economist um, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the investor George Soros, and the social philosopher John Gray, who had all been supporters of the neoliberal paradigm, now wrote scathing critiques of the deregulated global economy. 
I recommend, uh, even if it's 20 years old, uh, John Gray's book, Full Storm. It's very, uh, very perceptive. Uh, and he also uh, voices, you know, his, uh, his regrets. He admits that, you know, I was mistaken. I was wrong. What I hoped would happen didn't happen. Argentina went into an abyss, for example. <clears throat> At the same time, politicized religion and other forms of identity politics flourished from India to Israel, from Belfast to Brunei, contrary to 20th century predictions that education and modernity would weaken such forms of political identity, which were often divisive and regressive in character. The war in Yugoslavia and the Rwandan genocide, both unfolding in the mid-1990s, were reminders that an identity based on notions of kinship and descent did not belong to the past, but remained crucial for millions and could erupt in violent and dangerous ways at any time. 1991 was also at the height of uh, the Salman Rushdie affair. Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, had been published in 1988, denounced as blasphemous by powerful Muslim clerics, and the author had been sentenced to death in absentia by uh, Iranian clergy. The affair was a tangible reminder of a new kind of interconnectedness, where local or domestic acts can have instant global ramifications. A couple of years later, the European Union was formally established. All of this happened in the early 1990s. Um, the ambitious goals of the EU uh, led to the, uh, which uh, replaced the European Economic Community, as it was known until then, okay? uh, led to the destabilization of borders through the establishment of complex political and societal arrangements with important consequences for the satellite states as well, such as us, as a member of Schengen. As a result, the borders of and in Europe became more permeable, negotiable and fuzzy than before. And around the same time, mobile telephones and the internet began to spread epidemically in the global middle classes, eventually trickling down to the poor as well. Uh, there was a new kind of flexibility, a new kind of instantaneousness, um, bad news for the slow cumulative temporality of growth and development that we associate with forests, for example and perhaps with human beings going through a biographical itinerary. A similar kind of flexibility began to affect labor and business, and it was not the kind of flexibility that offers alternative paths for action, but one which created insecurity and uncertainty. Companies that used to distinguish between long-term and short-term planning ceased to do so, because nobody knew what the world would look like in five years anyway. Um, to workers, the most perceptible change has been basic insecurity. One of the most widely used new concepts in the post-millennial social sciences, along with the Anthropocene and neoliberalism, is the precariat, uh, which was introduced by the economist Guy Standing some six, seven years ago. And there are good reasons for its sudden popularity. The precariat consists of those millions of employees whose jobs are short-term and temporary and who, accordingly, have no clue as to whether they will have work next year or sometimes even next month. Very flexible, but insecure. This new class is as easily found in the British uh, construction sector and in Danish universities as in a Mexican sweatshop or a shipyard in the Philippines. None of them have their jobs for life. They have to be open, flexible, and versatile, forever. So, the first fact about the contemporary world, the post-1991 world, is accelerated growth. There are more of us. We engage in more activities, many of them machine-assisted, and depend on each other in ways, uh, far more ways than before. Each of us has, on an average, more links with the outside world than our parents or grandparents did, right? Um, now, we have long been accustomed to looking at the steep curves depicting population growth. Remember those from my school days, okay? Looked like this. I think Yesing quotes them as well in some of his popular books. Um, but the fastest growth does not take place in the realm of population. It goes without saying that the number of people with access to the internet has grown pretty fast since 1990, since hardly anybody at the time had internet. Okay? But it continues to accelerate, you see? The growth in internet use continues to accelerate, so the, the amount of time each and every one of us spends on their smartphones, for example, continues to accelerate, continues to grow. I just read somewhere, I didn't check the sources, so I don't know if this is kosher, but i give it a try anyway, that uh, the average American man checks his smartphone 200 times a day, okay? So uh, it continues to accelerate, 
at that level, but also at a macro level. So only in 2006, it was estimated that uh, less than 2% of sub-Saharan Africans, if we bracket South Africa, which has a different history, had access to the internet. Less than 2% in 2006. By 2017, the percentage was estimated to approach 30%. That's fairly steep, in a little more than 10 years. Uh, okay? Uh, largely owing to affordable smartphones rather than a mushrooming of internet cafes or the spread of laptops among Africans. So this also says something about the new Silk Road, I mean the, the new trade routes right, between countries like Nigeria and Zambia and uh, hubs in uh, southeastern China. Um, or we could look at migration. Around 1990 there were about 200,000 immigrants, including first generation descendants in Norway. By 2018 the figure exceeds 850,000. Okay? More than a fourfold increase. Uh, th th that is fairly steep in less than 30 years. Uh, or we could look at urbanization in the global south. Cities like Nouakchott in Mauritania or Mogadishu in Somalia have grown since the early 1980s from a couple of hundred thousand inhabitants to a couple of million each. The growth has, the growth has been a thousand percent in one generation. This is, also, this is not only the post war, post-war post world, but it's also the post-yesing world, right? He died in 1979. But he had some predictions, but not quite as dramatic as this. Uh, and the growth has been a thousand percent in one generation without an accompanying change in infrastructure. So if anybody wonders, I mean, when sometimes you see photos from Nouakchott and you see these long lines of people with water buckets waiting to fill them up to get their bucket for the day, you know why. They don't, have a, uh, you know, they don't have pipes to accommodate more than... Well, the, the city was built to accommodate about 50,000 people in the late 1950s. By the French colonial authorities, who at the time, in the late 1950s, assumed that the French Empire would last forever. That's why they built these cities, spent a lot of money. And, and four years later, virtually all of French West Africa had become independent countries. So that also tells something about, it should um, give a sense of humility, not only among economists, but also among other social scientists who try to make predictions. Or we could take tourism. As early as the 1970s, cultured North Europeans spoke condescendingly about those parts of Spain that they deemed to have been spoiled by tourism. I mean, you can walk into a place and you get your English newspaper, your Dutch rolling tobacco, in the Spanish cafes on the Costa del Sol, etc. But they'd only seen uh, the modest beginning. Um, in 1979, shortly after the end of fascism in uh, Spain, the total number of tourist arrivals was about 15 million. 15. By 2017, the number exceeds 60 million. In other words, a fourfold growth in less than 40 years. It's fairly, that, that is fairly steep, isn't it? So now you understand. That could have been the topic for a different lecture. Why people in Barcelona and Palma de Mallorca have had enough? and are demonstrating. They, they wanted to cool down. They don't want to get rid of all the tourists. They just want it to be sufficient, but not e excessive. Um, the growth in international trade has been no less spectacular than in tourism or urbanization. The container ship, with its associated cranes, railroads, standardized metal containers, and reconstructed ports, perhaps the symbol par excellence of an integrated, standardized, connected world slowly but surely gained importance from its introduction, or its, its invention rather, in the late 1950s to, until it had become the industry standard a few decades later. The ports of Shanghai and Singapore more than doubled their turnover of goods only between 2003 and 2014. That's quite recent, isn't it? More than doubled the turnover of goods. Mind-boggling. While world GDP is estimated to have grown by 250% since 1980, World Trade grew with 600% in the same period, a development made possible not least through the reduced transport costs enabled by the shipping container. I mean, the Chinese economic miracle would probably have been impossible without the, without the containerization of trade. And the Chinese know it, so they're now building container ports around the world in Sri Lanka and, and elsewhere. So, websites, international organizations, conferences and workshops, mobile phones and TV sets, private cars and text messages. The growth curves point steeply upwards in all of these and many other areas. In 2005, Facebook did not yet exist. A decade later, the platform had more than a billion users. 
Um, so yeah, and I could I could have gone on, but I realised that I, I can't. So I have to skip a few things. I have to skip the bit about the number of photos taken in the world, among other things, which has tripled in just five years, because everybody now takes photos with the mobile phones, with the smartphones. So that's that's easy. All right, I'm, I'm using this example anyway. It's, this is just a footnote. Uh, from between 2010 and 2015, the number of photos trebled. And uh, it's easy to discuss our ability to look at images um, needs research. Uh, it is common to say, at least in Norwegian and some, sometimes in English and other languages, that uh, a picture can say more than a thousand words. A bild is made and two And I think it's time to turn this on its head now. A word can say more than a thousand pictures. It's just a matter of finding the right word. <laughs> and that's why we have poetry and perhaps social sciences and, and humanities. Uh, so, uh, because there are, there are many, there's, there's no shortage of images these days, to put it mildly. But I have to move on, because the, the, the two, two of the major forces here are not the number of photos or the number of internet accounts or even container ships, perhaps, but population growth and the growth in energy use. Uh, the, gro the human population, uh, you know, it took us 200,000 years to reach the first billion. And then it took us just 100 years to reach the second billion at the time of Levi Strauss's birth, First World War. And after that, it only took us another 100 years to reach seven and a half. And it's still growing. Although since I was a child, they've been saying that these curves are now flattening out. But it's going to take a while because, as, uh, uh, I mean, because of the dynamics of population. Uh, the demographer Massimo Levi Bacci just published a book where he, uh, among other examples, uh, he mentions that the population of Nigeria, which is now double that of Germany, wasn't when I grew up. Africa was underpopulated when I grew up. But it's now double that of Germany. It will be eight times the population of Germany only in 2050. Which is, I mean, 30 years ahead. Okay. And not only that, but uh, the average age in Nigeria will then be 17, and the average age in Germany, 54. So, um, yeah, uh, clearly this is uh, something that we should keep in mind without becoming Malthusians, necessarily. Uh, now energy growth has been much faster than the growth in world population. In, in 1820, each human being used the equivalent of 20 gigajoules a year. Uh, by now, it's about 80. So there's been a fourfold increase. Of course, in many parts of the world, the growth has been much slower, and in some parts, like here and in California, much faster. And in reality, we're talking about a 30-fold increase. So. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, this, this is a, a situation that I think we should be uh, we aware of. The side effects are well known um, and have contributed in no modest way to the uh, decline of the uh, blind belief in progress and development. The visible and directly experienced ones are pollution and environmental degradation, the effects which are more difficult to observe and more consequential are the long-term climate changes and the depletion of non-renewable uh, energy sources. Because in a certain sense, all use of uh, fossil fuels is destructive because you destroy the energy source as you use it. Of course it's renewable, but it just takes a while. A few million years, and then you have it back. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm skipping a few bits here again, no worries, you can read all of it uh, when you like, um, and it's not important while I'm skipping. But it could be argued that if population had not begun to grow exponentially in the period after Thomas Malthus wrote his famous essay on population, on the principle of population, humanity might have evaded the most serious side effects of the fossil fuel revolution. Had there been just a billion of us, we could probably have done pretty much as we liked. We, we, we would have, as it were, been driving on a highway with no traffic. Now we're driving on a highway with a lot of traffic. We have to you know, look in the mirror all the time because there are many other people on the road. So we live in this world where modernity has shifted to higher speed. It has produced growth and prosperity, but it is also a volatile and ultimately self-destructive situation. Continued growth is theoretically impossible. This is a central conundrum of contemporary modernity, making conventional ideas of progress and development far more difficult to defend than it was just a year, uh, sorry, just a generation ago. And the loss of a script for the future. I mean, when did you last hear politicians talk about 2050. We're going to make it there. But everybody needs to contribute. It's going to be bloody hard, but we, we have to do it. They sell us fear and anxiety. Vote for us or else, instead of selling us hope and expectations, aren't they? So the loss of a script for the future. It also affects temporalities, leading to a presentism 
where just where both future and past become dimmed and out of focus. Okay, <clears throat> now this was my bid for a brief description of uh, the big sort of picture. Okay, and now let's uh, try to cut this down to size a little bit. The contemporary world of climate change and the Anthropocene, and that of global transformation in general, has provided research grants, jobs and publishing contracts for many academics. Some even become famous, at least within their orbit. In sociology, Sigmund Baumann and Ulrich Beck wrote important works about unpredictability until they both passed away recently, while Hartmut Rosa has devoted his research to social acceleration. The man who proposed the term Anthropocene in the first place was the atmospheric chemist Paul Critson, who is also the co-author of a widely uh, cited and very readable article with his colleague Will Steffen and the historian John McNeil on social aspects of uh, climate change, while the archaeologist Joseph Tainter has produced important analysis of the causes of civilizational collapse in the past. A perspective popularized by the self-made geographer Jared Diamond, originally trained as a physiologist. And, and Tainter is rather critical of some of Diamond's work, okay. although it's inspired by his own. Um, Tainter's path-breaking work, in particular, shows ways in which contemporary societies may be able to learn from archaeological research when faced with mounting or looming crises. In his comments on the present, which draw heavily on the studies of the collapse of the Roman and Maya empires, climate change comes across as just one factor in accounting for the decline of complex societies. The decisive cause consists in decreased marginal returns on investments in energy, EROI, right? uh, energy return of investment, owing to population growth and subsequent intensification of food production with decreasing returns, coupled with growth in bureaucratic, logistic and transport costs. Presently, resource shortages, a direct result of the anthropoid dominance of the planet, may be a more acute problem than climate change as such, although of course climate change contributes to the, uh, to the resource shortages through flooding and droughts and displacement of people. Since the early 19th century, we have been able to exploit enormous amounts of energy, at first just in the shape of abundant near-surface coal deposits, subsequently through the harnessing of oil and gas for the betterment of humanity. The fossil fuel revolution enabled us to support a very high and fast-growing global population with seemingly insatiable desires for consumption. Yet, the cost of taking out fossil fuels growth as a low-hanging fruit has been used up. At the same time, production relying on fossil fuels, as I mentioned, is tantamount to destruction. So in a dual sense, it is destructive, since we are simultaneously eating up capital, which it has taken the planet millions of years to produce, and are undermining the conditions for our own civilization by altering the climate and ruining the environment on which we rely. So, there is no easy way out. The lesson from cultural history, or one lesson from cultural history, may nevertheless be that lean societies, decentralized and flexible, with less bureaucracy than farming, fewer PR people than fishermen, are the most sustainable in the long term. You know, I belong to, I don't know if it's a minority view, but I belong to those who believe that the, the, the eventual collapse of the Roman Empire was really caused by, uh, by the colonization of Britannia, okay? That cold and desolate and uh, useless, in many ways, island that it cost so much to control and they got so little in return. I was so far away. And they colonized Dacia, you know, the, the present Romania at the same time. It's a similar sort of swampy place far away from Rome and with little going for it. Um, but they had to expand because they needed uh, to increase their tax income, right? So it was a dilemma for the Romans. Anyway, lean societies. As Tainter says, quote, complex societies are recent in human history. Collapse, then, is not to fall to some primordial chaos but a return to the normal human condition of lower complexity." Unquote. Views from the humanities on the Anthropocene are also developing fast, and one book, which admittedly is not an academic publication, but etched itself into my memory, was Royce Granton's 
beautiful but profoundly pessimistic learning to die in the Anthropocene, where what he speaks of is not individual death, but death as a civilization. How can we as a civilization learn to die gracefully? The author, an American ex-soldier who had driven an armored vehicle over the crushed remnants of Sumerian civilization as he entered the rubble that used to be Baghdad, urges us to learn to die gracefully, collectively, by listening to the distant voices of long-deceased fellow humans speaking to us from the past. Um, one could also mention historians like Sverker Sölin, a Swedish colleague, one of the early environmental historians and the author of a recent book-length essay about the Anthropocene. Or we could mention the important recent work of a social and increasingly environmental philosopher Arne van Lettlesen. Of course, I could have mentioned thousands of other names, from law scholars to environmental psychologists and evolutionary biologists to, to geologists. This sprinkling of names and academic specializations is merely meant to show that the interest in and the concern with the global predicament covers many disciplines and cannot be covered in one single fell swoop or contained in a single seminar room. It is mushrooming, if you like, in a rhizomatic way. And we, uh, we should be begin to connect the dots now, within this museum and beyond it. But it's a good start, because this is an interdisciplinary place. But there are still dots that remain to be connected. It's a good start. Um, and then come up to Blinan afterwards, both upper and lower Blinan. And we can do something wonderful and important. What then could be the indispensable contribution of anthropology to this lively and sprawling knowledge production on the Anthropocene, and in particular on climate change? <coughs> okay, for one thing, this anthropology has to be historically aware, interdisciplinary and explicit in connecting scales and levels of causality. You know, the, con the community-centered anthropology emerging at the beginning of the last century through Malinovskian functionalism, Radcliffe Brownian structural functionalism, and the Boasian historical particularism, was always a mixed blessing. It's shown in its meticulous attention to detail and the locally unique, but tended to ignore historical processes and large scale contexts. Yet, at the same time, I mean, when you, when you go into the history of anthropology, you realize that the, the narrative is, is more knotty, you know, it's more complex than you, that you, that you were told as an undergraduate. So the anthropology of transnational connections and global processes is not new. Even if it has periodically been marginalized, the anthropology of connections existed throughout the 20th century alongside the mainstream focus on small-scale societies and, uh, and socio-cultural integration. I, mean, I mentioned a couple of names, one could mention Robert Redfield, one could mention you know, many other people in anthropology who had this interest in comparison and global questions. And even Alfred Kroeber uh, had a deep interest in prehistory and archaeology. And, and he was an evolutionist. I mean, he, he concealed it whenever he spoke with Boas, but he was an evolutionist. So, and a very important theorist for, for the coming generations. So it's, all, it's not all a story from Boas to Clifford Geertz and then the postmodernists. There are other stories in anthropology. Even Malinowski himself went out of his way to place the Trobrian Islands in the broader regional context in his first book on the, on the Kula trade. For another second point, this anthropology has to be ethnographically grounded. Am I now contradicting myself? I hope not. It has to be grounded in ethnography, but it cannot be just ethnography. One reason that Yesing never became fully accepted or fully kosher in the anthropological establishment, I mean, notwithstanding his honorary membership in the Royal Anthropological Institute, was his lack of ethnographic fieldwork, which tended to make his readings of other ethnographies a bit superficial. It is through the treasure trove, or perhaps gold mine, consisting of hundreds of thousands, or, uh, at least thousands, Maybe hundreds of thousands now, okay? Because that also grows exponentially. Academic publishing also grows exponentially. So maybe we have hundreds of thousands of publications now. Detailed studies of local life that anthropologists can show how overheating and the effects of the Anthropocene not only affects different societies and places differently, but it also interpreted and acted upon in ways which are sometimes similar, but which also frequently differ in fairly fundamental ways. We react differently. We are affected differently and we react differently. And, uh, and you need, uh, 
you need the tools to explore this. Neither economic statistics, climatology, nor quantitative social science can perform this task. And since humans live in social worlds which are culturally shaped in complex ways, Understanding a life world, it may not be labor intensive because much of the time you just hang around waiting for people who never show up. So that's my experience. It may not be capital intensive, it's very cheap research compared to laboratory research and many other things. Very inexpensive, but it's time intensive. It takes a long time to do field work properly. And unless climate change mitigation is going to follow the same logic as corporations and centralized government, top down, neglecting local priorities and overrunning communities with exogenous change by telling them what to do without consulting them first. This kind of knowledge is essential in order to come to terms properly with the Anthropocene. Now returning to the um, simple question I asked at the beginning of this lecture, I have to ask not only how anthropology can help understanding the human world in all this diversity, but also how anthropological knowledge might help us out of the dead end of industrial modernity. The normative question raised by Essing. Problematic and difficult, but which you need to deal with. The double bind of contemporary global civilization. One approach consists in mining traditional societies which have proven to be ecologically sustainable over the last centuries or even millennia. The cold societies of Levi-Strauss. He distinguished between cold and hot societies. We are the hot ones. Um, a recent contribution to this school of thought in anthropology is Joy Hendry's book, Science and Sustainability, which is, which is recommended. It's a it's commendable reading. It's a good book by a good anthropologist. Science and Sustainability, Joy Hendry. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now, <coughs> Excuse me. Not getting overheating, heated, just, just coughing a bit. There were endless jokes. You know, we had an overheating seminar in January once, and it was minus 17. And there were endless jokes inside the seminar room. Are you sure about this metaphor, Thomas? You know, maybe we should you know, try something else. People had come from other parts of the world, and we were shocked, you know, to discover what winter was like here, or could be like. Um, okay, anyway, so although uh, some alternative communities in the affluent world emulate traditional societies and even aspects of the culture, it is unthinkable and plainly impossible that the majority of the world's population should revert to the low-tech life of small-scale societies. However, since anthropology can offer descriptions of thousands of social cultural configurations, it shows that there exist many recipes for the good life, not just one. The comparative study of values, and indeed value, points in this direction. The good life in many non-consumerist societies is not a hedonistically satisfying life, but a virtuous life, as in Aristotle's social philosophy. In South America, the Buen Vivir movement, Living Well movement, informed in part by anthropological thought and research. I'm thinking about anthropologists like Arturo Escobar, okay, who has written about this, is an attempt to move beyond what they see as the spiritual emptiness, the social inequality, and the destructive tendencies of global capitalism, emphasizing instead older ideas about how to live. It might be worth you know, at least listening to for a little while and see if they have something useful to come up with. Frederick Bath, who in most ways was rather remote intellectually from Yesing, once said that perhaps the most important existential insight from anthropology consisted in the realization that everything might have been different, even here. Buried in this statement is a potential cultural critique that Bath rarely developed himself, but which others have taken on. In his 1948 book, Mendes Gad et, Humanity is One, Yesing meditates on potential lessons to be learned from traditional societies, but without relinquishing the benefits of modernity. This was 1948, it's quite a long time ago. He was ahead of his time sometimes, in his, not least in his political thinking. Drawing on a wide range of ethnographic examples, he concludes that Western civilization ought to transcend its arrogance and demonstrate its postulated superiority by actually understanding, evaluating, and accepting other cultural forms. That's Yesing, 1948, page 108. And he adds, learning from them when appropriate. Another family of insights 
that anthropology can offer. Concerns the primacy of the local. Most of the time, I mean, we human beings don't live in countries, but in places. This is the case just as much for the Chinese, population 1.3 billion, as it is for Seychellois, population 90,000. Methodological nationalism, uh, where the country is seen as a natural unit, uh, was never part of the anthropological uh, toolkit, because we were looking at communities. Um, in practice, this would entail that policies usually have to be tailor-made. You can't have one policy for China, because China is a lot of things. You can't, you can't even have one policy for Norway, because Norway is a lot of things. Uh, and they have to be tailor-made, and they have, if they are going to be efficient and not just create resistance and resentment, they have to take the point of departure in the human resources people already possess. Which is also an old lesson from anthropology, but which one, one which bears repeating. Thirdly, anthropology is in a privileged position to address one of the chief sources of the democratic deficit experienced in many parts of the contemporary overheated Anthropocene world. Namely, the growing scale gap between decision-making and those who are decided upon. A main cause of the rise of populism, ethno-nationalism and politicized religion the powerlessness resulting from a feeling of not being taken seriously, but also not knowing who to blame and what to do, is a result of the opaqueness, aloofness and impenetrability of increasingly distant powers. Fourthly, anthropology continuously and tirelessly shows that one size does not fit all. What works in a small town in Queensland might not work in lower Manhattan what works in the local communities of Western Oslo might not work in Songdal in the western part of the country. Each place is interwoven with every other place, but each place also remains distinctive and unique. Now, as you would have realized, the communities that I have in mind here are not chiefly Bihari peasant villages or family-based Amazonian societies, but those of the affluent world. If anthropology is going to make a difference in practice, when it comes to confronting the double bind of the global system and the effects of the Anthropocene, a main empirical priority has to consist in focusing on the people living in those societies which created this situation in the first place. Not just the victims, but also the perpetrators. Us. So, what are the values guiding urban Norwegian academics when they, well, we, fly many times a year to give 20-minute presentations? at conferences, even if they, uh, we, are perfectly aware of the carbon footprint associated with frequent flying. How can we explain that Britons throw away a third of the food they buy? How can we account for the practice, or rather, how can the practices of Americans who associate driving with the in inalienable right that they call freedom be shifted without violating the fundamental beliefs? And how can Australians be waned off their dependency on air conditioning in a way compatible with Australian values and ways of life? These are questions that anthropologists are capable of answering, combining the timeless virtues of basic research with the urgency of applied research. So, the question beyond the necessary contributions of anthropological perspectives and knowledge is what could be a feasible alternative in a world which seems to have locked itself to a path um, which is bound to end with collapse. By the way, uh, footnote, the book on collapse is now, uh, has now arrived, okay? edited by uh, people here associated with this museum, uh, and it's, uh, it will be in a bookshop near you in a few days. Um, okay, so uh, I, I just got an email about it this morning. You see, accelerated communication, instantaneous communication. There is no simple answer to this. Indeed, there is not even general agreement about how to phrase the question. Healthy doses of intellectual and political imagination, bravery and collective determination will be necessary to move ahead to a world which is cooler, slower and scaled down. In a word, the kind of world anthropologists used to study before acceleration set in everywhere and about which we have a lot of knowledge and a lot to contribute, as do archaeologists and cultural historians. And we must keep in mind that there can be no return, as yes, perfectly well new, to a pre-modern world. The project at hand consists rather in creating a truly postmodern world, which uh, deals with the contradictions of modernity, 
rather than uh, just fooling around with linguistic deconstruction and theoretical playfulness, which is important in itself, but not enough. Uh, a postmodern world which retains the achievements of modernity while resolving its mounting contradictions. Throughout this effort, the anthropological and archaeological voices should be heard loudly and clearly as part of this, of the polyphonic chorus of knowledge. So, I thank you for your attention and for listening, and uh, the floor is now open for objections, disagreements, criticism, etc. Thank you.